Hi there, welcome. So I've made a series of videos here which is trying to connect molecular orbitals to so-called crystal orbitals. And crystal orbitals really form the foundation of electronic band structure diagrams, which can be really tricky to understand, but hopefully in this series of videos, by linking it to what you're familiar with in freshman chemistry of molecular orbitals, I'll make it palatable and understandable. The very first video will be somewhat of a review where we'll look again at conjugation in polyenes, something you've done in freshman chemistry, and talk about just simple box pictures of band diagrams in metals. And then in the second video, we'll go beyond that and see how we can quantify these crystal orbitals and their wave functions and introduce the so-called k-vector. I hope you'll find these understandable and enjoyable. In this series of videos then we will be looking at band diagrams. We're trying to understand what they are and why they're useful. We'll begin with a review of some of the things you have probably seen in Chem 101 which is the relationship of molecular orbitals and crystal orbitals so we'll briefly review that and then we'll go on to quantify the nodes in wave functions using what's called the k-vector. We'll then develop band diagrams for one-dimensional and two-dimensional systems, and then show some of the band diagrams which get a little bit more complicated when it goes to 3D for the 3D crystals. We'll talk about direct and indirect band gaps, and the importance and consequences of those for optical absorption and photovoltaic systems. Finally, we'll come back and revisit the polyenes where we started with molecular orbital conjugation and talk about k-vectors for those systems. And then lastly, we'll get into metal insulator transitions and briefly discuss the piles distortions. Well, here are some band diagrams for three different systems, aluminum metal, gallium arsenide and silicon, which are both semiconductors. They're sometimes jokingly called spaghetti diagrams because it looks as though we've hung spaghetti all over a rack. But what's being plotted here? What is the meaning of all of these symbols? Clearly we're plotting energy on this left axis, on the bottom K. So from these diagrams, believe it or not, we can deduce if a system is metallic or semiconducting, and we can also identify if that semiconductor has what's called a direct or indirect band gap. But what do these lines represent? What are we plotting? What is K? What are all these symbols on the bottom? And how do we read these diagrams to interpret the electronic behavior of a material system? Let's start this discussion by going back to molecular orbital theory. And here we're going to focus on the conjugation or if you like, delocalization of pi orbitals in the so-called polyene systems, which are carbon-carbon bonded systems with alternating double and single bonds. In the polyenes, each carbon has a steric number of three. Let's pick one out here. It's bonded to one other carbon and two hydrogens, so the steric number is three, and this is achieved by forming three sp2 hybrids, that overlap with its neighboring orbitals to form sigma bonds. So here is the sigma bonded network, if you like. Well, we've used three atomic orbitals of the carbon, 1s and 2p's, to form the sp2 hybrids. That leaves one remaining orbital perpendicular to the plane of the molecule. That's the pz, and it's those that overlap with each other to form the pi bonds. Because we have four carbons in the system, we have four PZ orbitals capable of bonding with each other and overlapping with, the, with each other to form the pi system. And we'll linearly combine those atomic orbitals to form the four conjugated or delocalized molecular orbitals of pi character. And so here we are in this energy diagram. Here's my PZ atomic orbitals, all four of them. And the way they can overlap is unique to each resultant molecular orbital. 
The best way, the most stable way, is for each of them to overlap in phase. And so here actually we're adding the atomic orbital wave functions. We'll get to that in a minute. And we form the most stable system. The next most stable orbital, we can't repeat the same one, they all have to be different, will have what's called one anti-bonding nodal plane. The next orbital will have two anti-bonding nodal planes, and finally, the highest energy one, which is pi star anti-bonding in the extreme, will have three anti-bonding nodal planes. And so the overlaps here are just shaded. I've shaded the in-phase overlaps. That's where we get the good bonding. One at the bottom, of course, they're all in phase. And then when I go to the top, everything is out of phase with its neighbors. These two, these two, these two. We have those three nodes, and it's the highest energy. And the energy progressively increases with the increasing number of anti-bonding nodal planes. Let's take a look at the formation of these so-called anti-bonding nodal planes in a little bit more detail. So actually the nodal planes correspond to a change in the sign of the contributing atomic orbital, which we'll just give shorthand as chi here. So this represents whatever the orbital is, in this case a pz orbital. And here's the four MOs we just formed in butadiene. And let's look at the wave functions. So here is the wave function represented by psi of this lowest energy pi 1 orbital. And we see here the four contributing atomic orbitals, each pz, are added. The magnitude of their contribution, how much of each one we're using for this particular molecular orbital, is represented by the c coefficients that are multiplying that atomic orbital contribution. So for this lowest energy orbital, all the atomic orbitals their linear combinations are additive. Now let's go to Psi 2. In this case, one of the atomic orbitals is subtracted, if you like. So I see I'm adding chi 1, adding chi 2, it's minus chi 3, and then minus chi 4. The key to understanding this nodal plane is what it corresponds to. It's not so much that it corresponds to a negative or positive sign. It actually corresponds to a change in sign. And so when I go from plus to minus, there's a change in sign here. This is where my nodal plane resides. There is not one here. So I go from negative to negative. I don't put another one here because there is no change in sign. As we go up to psi 3, now I systematically increase the number of nodal planes. So psi 3, there are two, and the contributions of the atomic orbitals are plus for one, minus for two, here's my nodal plane, then minus for three, no nodal plane, it hasn't changed sign, it's re remained minus, and then finally the fourth one is added, so there's a plus, so here's there's a change in sign, and another nodal plane. Finally in psi 4, the most anti-bonding, the highest energy of all four molecular orbitals, the signs alternate, plus minus, plus minus. And so my nodal planes, again positioned at the sign changes, there are three, where I go from plus to minus, minus to plus, plus to minus. So it's the change in sign for the contribution of the atomic orbital that results in the outer phase anti-bonding overlap. The more the nodes in this case, the higher the energy. To actually specifically calculate the magnitude of the energies, and again you would have seen this in Chem 101, it's possible to use the particle in a box model to calculate how the energy increases with the number of antinodal planes. We won't get into that here. Now if I go to hexadiene, another polyene, but in this case, I've got six carbons in this chain, alternating double bond, single bond. Again, it's sp2, but now I have six pz orbitals contributing to the pi molecular orbital. I've got more contributing aos, six, so I'll get more mos. Of course, we know the rule about conservation of orbitals. Number of orbitals in equals the number of orbitals out. So in this case, the interactions, the overlaps range from, again, the most stable, 
we'll find is always in phase, or more specifically, all the atomic orbitals are additively combined. Going up then to the pi 2, now there's one change in sign, one anti-bonding nodal plane. Psi 3, two changes in sign, two anti-bonding nodal planes. Psi 4, three changes in sign. Psi 5, four changes in sign. Psi 6, the highest energy completely anti-bonding orbital, five changes in sign, plus minus, plus minus. We see here then, as I add more contributing atomic orbitals, and resulting in more molecular orbitals, the energy separation between adjacent energy levels, between adjacent MOs, decreases. The lowest energy is always where I add everything, and all of the AOs are in phase or constructively interfering with each other. The highest energy is always the completely anti-bonding set of atomic orbitals, where they're out of phase with respect to each other. And in between, I have, in this case, my four other levels. But because I'm squeezing more levels between the most anti-bonding and the most bonding, delta E, the difference in energy between 1 and 2 or 2 and 3, is reduced as I put in more and more contributing atomic orbitals into the mix. So, as the number of contributing AOs increase, the energy separation decreases. Let's extend that approach to look at valence orbital overlaps in metals. As our example, we'll use sodium with a single valence electron in the 3s orbitals. And let's slowly build up a chain of sodium atoms, starting with Na2. So for diatomic Na2, I have two 3s orbitals. They can form an in-phase, plus plus, or out of phase, plus minus, molecular orbitals. Here's three sodiums. Now as I add more sodiums into this mix, I'm adding additional MOs in between the extremes of bonding and anti-bonding. Na4, Na6, and as we mentioned, as I add more contributing atomic orbitals, I'm decreasing the energy separation between these MOs. And now I can go all the way to an infinite chain of sodium atoms where between the extremes of all bonding and all anti-bonding, I fill those in with an infinite number of levels between the two. And so now what I have is a continuous band, as it's called. For sodium, this band is half full, because the contributing atomic orbitals only have a single electron. And so rather than drawing a diagram with an infinite number of lines to represent all the MOs, I just draw a box and show its filling. Because it's partially filled, it will actually be a metal. So in this sort of band structure box representation then, on the left here I'm just showing the contributing AOs, an infinite number of them, singly occupied. Here's my band, my box of infinite levels. Let's dismiss all of those lines and just show a single box where we're imagining these infinite number of levels within it. And here we just shade in the amount of filling, 50% full in this particular case. And that highest occupied level is called the Fermi level. And because this is metallic and the electrons can move and conduct, we call it a conduction band. Why can they conduct? Why is it called a conduction band? Well, number one, I have formed crystal orbitals, orbitals that are delocalized over the entire set of sodium atoms in the solid. So I have pathways from one side of the solid to the other. Uh, but that's not enough. I need the ability to move in those pathways. And because it's only 50% filled, I have empty states available. And so it costs very little energy for an electron in this filled Fermi level orbital to just move up to an unoccupied level above it. That energy separation is very, very small, we'll quantify it in a second, and so it's easy to thermally excite the electrons to those empty levels to get conduction. How small is that energy level separation? Well, for sodium, this bandwidth is roughly 10 electron volts, and if I had one mole of sodium atoms, I'd have one mole of energy states between the top and the bottom, Avogadro's number. So dividing 10 EV by the number of levels the separation is 10 to the minus 22 electron volts. 
Obviously, that's a very small number. Just to put it in context, at room temperature, thermal energy, Kt, where K is the Boltzmann constant, is 0 0.026 eV. Orders of magnitude greater thermal energy is available to overcome the energy separation of adjacent levels, and therefore we will undoubtedly populate several unoccupied levels, allowing the conduction properties to take over. So we've reviewed much of this in lecture, now let's go a step further and see how we can start to quantify, in a slightly more rigorous sense, the crystal orbitals in solids.